Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're so very glad that you're here with us to worship and to learn and fellowship with each other. If you'll stand with us and sing, sing a chorus, King to My Rescue. By life, be lifted high in our world, be lifted high in our love, be lifted high, falling on my knees in worship. this morning. Thank you that uh, you are our rescuer, and uh, thank you that you are always here for us, and uh, thank you for allowing us to worship you this morning, and please bless the rest of our worship service in our sermon this morning. 
In Jesus' name, amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when so.
I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing still call me friend is the god of the mountain is the god of the valley there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again
turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church of Phoenix. November 1st, 2020. We only have two more months until we can see 2020 in the rearview mirror. I think we're all kind of looking forward to that. But I have just a couple announcements. If you're here for the first time, in the pew in front of you, there's a connection card if you are willing to give us your information. You can fill that out and place that in the offering box, which is on the door as you are leaving the sanctuary. Uh, but just a couple announcements today, because this is the first Sunday of the month. We haven't done this in several months, but the first Sunday of the month, we have what's called a New Here, Eat Here lunch. And Pastor Mike and myself, we will meet with anyone who wants to stick around afterwards. Today we're going to have soup and sandwiches. It's just a very nice way, casual way to get to know us, ask us any questions about the church. So if there's anyone who would like to uh, join us today after church for the New Here, Eat Here lunch, uh, please stick around. It'll be about 10, 15 minutes right after the service is done. And in two weeks from tonight is our Western night. Well, there we go. All right. <laughs> There's a little preview of our Western night. We, we always look forward to this, and we're doing this every other year with our Thanksgiving banquet. This year, it's going to be our Western night. And this year because of the pandemic and everything that's going on, it is a BYOP, bring your own picnic. Bring your own food, beverages, utensils, everything, preferably paper so we can just throw everything away. Um, but you do that, we are going to open up the tables at 5.30. The music is gonna start shortly thereafter, about 5.45. Um, if you wanna get here even a little bit earlier, bring a you know, barbecue grill and tailgate or do whatever, feel free, we're just gonna have fun two weeks, Saturday night, November 14th. And also we will have our pie eating contest. That's right. Where is Matt Bray, the defending, Matt, can you please stand up? Just show us who the champ is. Matt Bray, three time champion of the pie eating contest. Someone needs to take him down, all right? <laughs> and, and we've had, but we've had th only three champions so far. Matt has been at three times. David Kincaid, King David, had a one-year reign as king. And Jocelyn Sanders, the only female conqueror of the pie eating championship. So if you would like to be in this for this coming, this coming year, what you can do is sign up. And next Sunday, we are going to draw names for the privilege of trying to dethrone Matt Bray as champion. 
And this year, the, ch the, the reigning champ always gets to decide what kind of pie it's going to be, and he chose apple because apparently that's his good luck pie. You, have you only won you, eating apple pie? Apparently so, at least twice. So, all right, guys, come on, or girls, we got we to gotta take Matt Bray down. He's, uh, he's getting a little too confident these days. But anyway, so that is going to be on um, Friday, fr uh, Saturday the 14th. And also you'll notice in your bulletins, there is an invitation card. We did hand these out yesterday at the Trunk or Treat. But if you have a friend or a family member that you would like to invite to our Western Night, um, give them this card. It has our information, has the information for Western Night. And then also, which is leading us into our next uh, series of announcements, our Christmas program is going to be Sunday, December 20th at 6 o'clock p.m. And this is also an invitation for them. And speaking of that, is Sarah, is Sarah in here? There she is, right in the front row. Sarah has some announcements. Thank you, Pastor. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, a bittersweet announcement, but um, I would like to um, just keep everybody up to date on things that are happening in our leadership and our nursery leadership. We have had Jocelyn Sanders and Selena Stinson, and I think they're back there in the back row, right? I feel like a star, I can't see. Um, if you guys could stand up, just really quick. Sorry. They've done an amazing job leading our nursery. Yeah, thank you. Especially coming out of COVID and everything, and I just really want to thank you for all you do. Um, Jocelyn is taking a breather from leading, and we want to thank you, Jocelyn, from the bottom of my heart. Um, you've just been a joy to work with, and I think all the leaders and the parents would agree. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, I got tickled my throat. Um, but I hope you have a nice rest and come back soon, right? Um, and along those lines, uh, the sweet part of it, um, we have Hannah Hodgson that is joining the nursery committee. Hannah, can you stand? Hannah comes to us. Hannah comes to us with um, a lot of experience previously, um, not only in a church, but having four children herself. So a lot of experience. And uh, I, I just love her, her passion um, and concern for the, for the babies. So um, join me in welcoming her. Um, if you ever want to volunteer for the nursery, please see one of these lovely ladies, and they would be glad to get you involved, right? Yeah. Um, along those lines, I'm still plugging holes uh, post-COVID, so if you are interested, if your heart is for the children of the church, and you're interested in helping or teaching the preschool through sixth grade, any of those classes, uh, Sunday school or junior church hour, um, we need you. So please feel free to see me, text me, my information's on the back of the bulletin. You can call me, text me anytime. Lastly... Sorry, I'm trying to go fast. Lastly, the children's uh, Christmas program, it's not just children, but um, a big portion of it is the children. We are beginning today with um, some rehearsals. So parents, important information for you to know. The kids uh, preschool through sixth grade will be involved during church hour with um, phase one, we'll call it. Um, it's, I, I don't want to give too much away, but phase one will be during church hour. In December, those same kiddos have to be here for Sunday school. We're going to be practicing in the church on the sanctuary and the stage here um, during Sunday school hour for the rest of the program for the first three weeks of December. So please try to have your kids here um, whenever possible. So kids, today when you're dismissed and for the rest of um, December, November and December, um, up through sixth grade, you'll, you'll join us in, in the fellowship hall. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And yeah, we're not going to tell you what the uh, Christmas program is going to be this year, but it's, it's going to be different, and I'm really looking forward to this. I think it's going to be pretty good. So uh, make sure that you schedule Sunday, December 20th here at the church at 6 o'clock into your calendar. Uh, that's it for announcements. Make sure you read through the bulletin. But at this time, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for the offering. And then when we're done, the kids up through third grade will be dismissed. And just as a reminder, for those of you who came prepared to give, um, the two ways that you can give are either online or there is a box that you can put your offering in as you are leaving the sanctuary. But let's, let's turn to the Lord in prayer at this time. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you and we have, we have a, a lot of concerns on our heart. We are a very uh, 
curious to see how the fate of our country is going to play out in the next uh, several years. Uh, but Lord, help us to remember that we have a calling in this life and in this world. Uh, we are your ambassadors. No matter what happens, we have the good news of your grace to share with our family, with our friends, and with our neighborhood. So Lord, uh, just give us that calm assurance that we need. And Lord, I just pray for the rest of this message as we talk about what Paul exchanged from his past into something that he could never have earned for himself, and that is your grace and your righteousness. Lord, as we just spend time thinking about this and dwelling on this, um, help us to, to let these truths sink in deep into our heart and our mind so that we will be the people that you have called us to be. Lord, we love you. Bless our time studying your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed, all the kids up through third grade. That's what I meant. Sixth grade, thank you for correcting me. Probably won't be the last time either. And I am going to actually have Travis and Jocelyn Sanders come on up. Um, we have a, a great family in Travis and Jocelyn, and they have recently decided to take upon themselves a, a wonderful responsibility. Uh, they are now foster parents. And so I just asked them to share with us what it means to be foster parents, how we can be praying for them and encouraging them, and come on up. Who wants the mic first? I'll take it. Okay. Get back up. Did you see that? <laughs> Uh, so first off, we'd like to acknowledge that there are other foster families in this in this church, and they're doing an awesome job and definitely an inspiration to us. Um, I guess we would just start with kind of how we were called to this. Uh, I'm a firefighter, and I've worked as an EMT for a long time, so I've got to see a lot of kids that are in the system or are going to be in the system, a lot of neglect, a lot of abuse, and uh, so that, that was just a burden on my heart for a long, long time, and then... Um, Throughout the years of being in this church, we've been able to be a part of a lot of children's ministries, and for some reason, God just kept putting all the foster kids in our groups, mine and my wife's. So, you know, when God's calling you to something, sometimes you can ignore it for a while, but he's just going to be persistent. He's going to keep nagging at you until you finally recognize it. So I think that's kind of where we would start with this whole journey, is just um, trying to listen to God, consistently asking him, you know, like, what do you have for us? Well, I'm showing you. <laughs> and uh, finally, we opened our, our hearts and our minds to uh, letting him uh, work in our lives that way. Do you want to start from there? Uh, okay. Sure. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm getting into it, yeah. I got this. All right. <laughs> uh, so we started the foster care process um, right before COVID, and COVID did slow it down a little bit, but we were finally certified in September. And uh, we kind of hit the ground running right away. Uh, our goal this whole time was we just wanted to adopt. Um, we wanted to adopt out of the foster um, care system, and we just thought we were going to get the first kid. We were going to be like, this is the perfect fit. We're going to be able to adopt them, and that's how it's going to be. But God had other plans for us, like he always does. Uh, and we got our first little girl. Her name was Mia. Um, okay. <clears throat> her name was Mia. She was very sweet. Uh, she was four years old, and... Uh, sorry. Uh, she... Um, she got sent back really soon to a horrible situation. So um, if you guys could be praying for her, um, a lot of you guys already are. We really appreciate all of the support from family and church and all of you guys already. Um, she got sent back right away to a really horrible situation and um, we're just constantly praying for her safety and just for her little life to be touched by other Christians, because I'm sure that we are not the only ones that are going to be put in her life. Um, after that, um, actually just two days later, we got another little guy. He is so full of energy, and you've probably seen him running around here. His name is Leonard. Uh, he, is, he actually turned five while he's been with us, and we've had him for about a month now. Um, he, he came from another awful situation where his parents just made some really bad decisions, and um, he, uh, he has a lot of, um, he needs a lot of love. 
he has a lot of behavioral issues and um, he just has some other stuff going on, but we have constantly been seeing God blessing him and us with just patience and wisdom and he is growing so fast and well. He's only been with us for a month, but already he says please and thank you and he says sorry when he hurts someone and if like that is such a difference from the very first day we got him it was temper tantrums all day long intentionally trying to hurt other kids um, running out into the middle of the street it was it was intense but we're so thankful we tell you that because God is so faithful when he calls you to do something that he is going to give you every bit of patience and strength and um, the people we're not doing this on our own. Um, Travis and I, we kind of like to power through things on our own and never ask for help. But when God calls you to do something, he's never going to ask you to do it on your own. And so between family and friends and you guys at the church, you've already been helping in ways that are just so amazing. Between oh, the Awana program and just Selena and Lori and Sarah and Emma, um, being there and being patient with Leonard and the Sunday school teachers with their patience and their kindness. Um, guys, when you volunteer for a program at our church, you're touching lives in ways that you might not realize. And we really, really do appreciate you guys. Um, even Hannah Hodgson and Selena taking over for nursery so that I can just have a little bit more time and <laughs> a breather and a little bit more focus on my kids and um, little Leonard. We just really appreciate all that. and. Um, we, not everyone is called to foster care, <laughs> obviously, um, but God is calling you guys to do something. And we never want to just be on the receiving end of the support. We always want to be able to pray and encourage you guys in whatever God is calling you to do. So if you guys um, are called to foster care and you want to talk to us, I'm sure Matt and Kim McFadden would love to share any experiences they have with you. The Venables have also done it. There might be others of you in this church that have done it, but if you just want to reach out to us or any of them, I'm sure we would love to just come alongside you, pray for you, um, give any resources we have for you. That would be awesome. Um, but if you're not called to foster care and God is calling you to do something else, we also want to be there for you. We want to be able to pray and encourage you and just help you in any way we can. Um, yeah, do you have anything? Yeah, home run, good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing is um, I know that we're impacting Leonard and any other children that God brings into your, yeah. your care. But is there any other way that we can be helping, helping you, praying for you, anything specific? Uh, yeah, like Jocelyn said, Leonard's made huge strides in his attitude, and he loves coming to church because of you guys, because of the leadership and the, the just learning about Honey Bear, which is what he calls Awana. He's because he's in cubbies and he loves hearing about Jesus so I tell him the stories while he's going to bed and he's like oh I remember that one so it has been really cool to watch him just learn about God and want to learn more about him so thank you for everything you guys do and one thing that we might do is um, there might be a toy drive for the foster care kids yes so I'm working on that uh, the foster system in Arizona is heavily overloaded we what 25% to so we got like, what, 5,000 homes for foster kids and 20,000 kids to go into foster homes. So 4,000 homes. Yeah, 4,000. So less homes, more kids. Yeah. Um, so they're overloaded. They're, they're backed up. So I'm trying to communicate with them and figure out how we can do a toy drive for all these kids. And they, they haven't been getting back to me, but I'm working on it. And we're going to try to do a toy drive this Christmas for foster care. Oh, one other thing. Sorry. Um, we are not just impacting the, the we, we've come to realize this isn't a ministry just to the foster kids. Um, we have so much contact with the state, with therapists, with the parents. And when we first got into this, we were like, oh, these parents are horrible people. You know, they're making horrible choices. They're not loving their kids. But a lot of times that's not, that's not the thing. The thing is these people need Christ. And if you guys could just be praying for us that we'll be able to show them God's love in all of this, they're making bad decisions, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't love them and doesn't have something better for them. So just pray with that. Amen. All right, well, we'll get together with Travis and Jocelyn and find out about this toy drive. Hopefully this is something that we could be doing so you can start planning. Christmas is in a couple months from now. 
shock. <laughs> yeah, be, be prepared for that. Uh, and we are having Christmas this year. But um, yeah, just if you see some toys, maybe you want to take some and set some aside. We'd like to be a part of this toy drive. But thanks, guys. I want to pray for you really quick before you sit down. Dear Lord, I, I thank you so much for my brother and sister in Christ, Travis and Jocelyn, and just the passion that they have for you and that they want to serve you in any way and that they've responded um, to this calling you've placed on their life. May we just be an encouragement to them and also come alongside them and just be a blessing to any children you bring into their household. Um, thank you for giving us the truth that we need to have hope and help us in any way, shape, or form to pass this on to others. But Lord, I just pray and I ask your blessing upon the Sanders family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank thanks. thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right. Well, for our message, we are going to be moving on into Philippians chapter 3 and kind of picking up where we left off last week. But last week we talked about um, Paul and all the things that he thought were valuable in his life. But what we saw and what we can see is that beauty is, you know, you, you hear the saying, beauty is an eye of be the beholder. Well, sometimes value is as well. What one person thinks is valuable might not be what another person thinks is valuable. And you've probably heard the phrase, one man's junk is another man's treasure. I, I think that's very true. Some of you may have heard this. This happened a while ago. This was back in like 2005. There was a young man by the name of Kyle McDonald, and he chronicled this journey that he went through where he tried to trade a red paper clip and see what he could get from this. Now, some, some of you might understand this, you know, know um, what happened, but here is Kyle McDonald. This is back in July of 2005. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to figure out ultimately what he could trade this red paper clip for. And he eventually, through a series of 14 trades, traded for a house. He went from a paperclip to a house. Kind of amazing. Let me, let me tell you all the things that he traded for. It started with this red paperclip, and he traded that paperclip for a fish-shaped pen. I don't have a picture of the pen, but you can imagine what that looked like. He traded the pen the same day for a hand-sculpted doorknob in Seattle, Washington. About a month later, he traveled to Massachusetts and he traded that doorknob for a Coleman Camp stove with fuel. So he's already kind of trading up a little bit, you know, trying to, he's finding things that are more valuable. He traded that camp stove for a Honda generator. That's kind of impressive. A paperclip to a generator? Yeah, you know, that, that, that's, that's pretty impressive. Then, and, and I'm just reporting, <laughs> reporting what he traded for, he went to Maspeth, Queens, uh, up in Canada, and he traded the generator for what is called, he had called an instant party, and this is, he had an empty keg and an IOU to fill the keg with beer and a, a neon Budweiser sign, all right? That's what he got. Then he traded that to a Quebec com comedian, a radio personality named Michael Barrett for a snowmobile. Pretty good. So he's already up to a snowmobile. He traded the snowmobile for a two-week trip in Yank, British Columbia, and then he traded one of the two people, because he went on this trip, and I think he went with somebody else. He traded that, the second spot, for a box truck. So now he's up to this a large box truck. He traded the box truck in February of 2006 for a recording contract with Metalworks in Ontario, Canada. Then after that, he traded the contract to a woman here in Phoenix for a year's worth of free rent. Not bad, huh? Started with a paperclip, now he has a year's free rent. Then, this is kind of where it gets really interesting, he traded the year's worth of free rent for one afternoon with Alice Cooper. Phoenix's own Alice Cooper. Apparently someone thought that was valuable. I, yeah, Alice Cooper, you know, I like him, don't like him, whatever. Then he traded that one hour, that afternoon with Alice Cooper to a, a man for a Kiss motorized snow globe. I should have put a picture of that up there. It was, it's kind of interesting. And now he's on his 13th and 14th trade. He traded the snow globe to actor Corbin Burnson for a role in a film that he was about to make called Donna on Demand. This was back in 2006. And then finally he traded that role in the movie, Donna on Demand with Corbin Burnson, for a farmhouse in Kipling, Saskatchewan. That's his house. 
So he traded that paper clip all the way up to that house. And so here he is, he's got a little more facial hair. He went from that paper clip to that house. Pretty impressive, huh? Really impressive. There's a book and you can see YouTube videos on this. I think that he must be uh, a really good salesman to be able <laughs> to pull this off. But it's kind of interesting that every time he traded one item for the other, there was a difference in value. Someone that he traded with Kyle said, what you have is more valuable than what I have. We come across things in this life and we find value in places that we don't expect and we find value in things that we might not expect. In the Gospels, there's a really good story, a really good parable in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And it says, the kingdom of heaven, we're going to go back, do we skip ahead? Matthew 13, there we go. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The kingdom of heaven. And here what Jesus is saying in this parable is, there is the truth about God's plan and God's grace. And if you find that, it's worth leaving everything else in your life behind to hold on to something that you can never lose. Paul had a similar experience. We looked at this last week, but that wasn't a parable. This happened to Paul in real life. Paul says, then when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, everything that he had valued in his life up to that point in time became worthless. And he gave it up, and he pursued the truth that he found in Jesus Christ. And that's what we looked at last week. We looked at Paul's very impressive resume. And from a human standpoint, he had one of the best resumes that any human ever had. In fact, I think any Jew would love to have had Paul's resume. Let's read that verse. This is from Philippians chapter 3. This is what we looked at last week, verses 4 through 7. Paul says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's what we looked at last week. And we looked at what each of those phrases, those seven qualifications that he had, or what, what they meant. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. And in it, what do, Paul does is he tells us what he found in Christ that made him consider his past worthless. And so for today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two things that Paul found in the present that have more value than his past. And then next week, we're going to look at some things that Paul finds value in the future that he and we have to look forward to. Verses 8 and 9 here in Philippians 3. He goes on and he says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And the main point of these two verses of this section is what Paul now knows. He knows Christ. He knows whose righteousness he depends on. So here are two things that are more valuable for Paul and for us today than our human accomplishments. And the first thing is knowing Christ. Knowing Christ is more valuable. And the word that Paul uses for, for, um, for know is the Greek word gnosko. And it means more than just knowing information about something. It has an experiential aspect to it. As an example, uh, this afternoon, many of you are going to go home, and most of you, I'm assuming, I don't want to assume too much, but most of you guys might go home, turn on the TV, and watch a football game. And you are going to pride yourself on how much information you know about football. Some men know everything there is about football. They sit at home and they know the formations of the players. They know the players' background, their history, their contracts, all of those things. And some ladies, not everyone, but they're like, ah, oh, they don't care about that. 
Kind of reminds me of a story back in the late 80s. My dad got tickets to a preseason Seattle Seahawks game. And, this, and they were going to be playing the San Francisco 49ers. And my dad said, hey, you want to go to this game? I said, you bet I want to go to this game. This was the year after Joe Montana and Jerry Rice won the Super Bowl. So I wanted to go see the Super Bowl champs play the Seahawks. And I said, Dad, can I bring a friend? He said, yeah, you can bring a friend, but first let's ask if your sister wants to go. And so we asked my sister Amy, who knows nothing about football, and she said, yeah, I want to go. And I was so upset because she didn't know football. She didn't like football. And we're sitting in the stands, and she's watching Joe Montana run around, and she had the audacity. Amy, if you watch this, I hope you watch this. I love you, but I'm never going to forget this. But she had the audacity to ask, hey, what's that thrower guy doing? <laughs> thrower guy? What are you talking That's the quarterback. And my sister's going to the game, and I could have brought a friend that knew anything about football. Anyway, I'm over it. Years of counseling have, have cured me of that, that situation. But, but a fan, they, they, they know football, right? But a football fan cannot possibly know football like one of the players does. Someone who has played for 10 or 20 years and went on from junior high to high school to college to the professional ranks, they know football in a way that a casual fan could never know. They know what it's like to wake up on Monday morning after playing a game. They know what it's like to have the emotions after a defeat and even the emotional demands. They know about the stress of the contract negotiations or the, the camaraderie between the teammates. They, they know football because they've played it. That's what Paul is saying with this word. He now knows Christ. He doesn't just have intellectual information about Jesus Christ. He knows him. He's had fellowship and communion with Jesus Christ. I want to give you kind of an interesting side note. I came across this as I was studying. I thought this was very interesting. There is an Old Testament equivalent to this word in the, in the Greek New Testament. When they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek, in the Septuagint, gnosko was used to translate the Hebrew word yada. And the word yada means to know someone. In fact, it's actually used as an Old Testament euphemism for sexual intimacy in, in a pure and a good way. So in the Old Testament, you have the word, the Hebrew word yada, describing a sexual relationship between a husband and a wife, and sometimes um, that intimacy that you see between God and the nation of Israel. So the phrase yada yada is Jewish. So now you know, be careful who you use that phrase on, right? <laughs> and, and who you say it to. But anyway, I thought that was very interesting, this idea that you know, you know someone. When Paul says that now he knows Christ, he understands the truth about who Jesus Christ is, but also he has an experience with him in an experiential way. We now have communion with Christ. There's a couple of verses in the New Testament that use this word, and in this context, it's, it's pretty neat what we learn from it. First one that I want to share with you is John 10, 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And what a great example that he uses between the shepherd and the sheep. And you can kind of picture this. You can kind of picture a shepherd and his sheep out there in the pasture, and the shepherd and the sheep, they know each other. The sheep know, they recognize physically their shepherd. They hear, they know the voice of their shepherd. And because he's a good shepherd, the sheep know that the shepherd will always defend them and guide them to the greenest, most lush pastures. And the shepherd knows the sheep. He knows each and every one of them individually. He knows the naughty ones. He knows the ones that are going to run away. He knows the good ones that are going to follow. He knows the sheep. He knows their sights. He knows the weak ones, the old ones, the young ones. The shepherd knows the sheep. They've experienced life together. And Jesus says, I know my sheep, and my sheep, they know me. And now Paul says, I now know the shepherd. I know who Jesus is. And for us, the more time we spend studying God's word and worshiping him together, we get to know our shepherd. We get to know Jesus Christ. Here's another passage that has a, makes a great use of this word to know. This is in John 17, 3. 
This is in Christ's high priestly prayer the night before he was betrayed and died on the cross. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus says eternal life is to know God. And usually when we think of things that are eternal, we think of something in terms of the duration of time, and that's a correct way to think about things that are eternal. But Jesus tells us that knowing and experiencing God both now and in the future is eternal life and has the focus on both the quality of that time as well as the quantity of time. To know God is eternal life. And now Paul knows Christ. And so why did Paul value Christ, knowing Christ, more than all of his other accomplishments? Because in knowing Christ, he knows the truth. He knows the truth of God's plan. He knows the truth, the most important truth that the world has. Knowing that we have a creator who loves us and provides what is best for us is better than anything that you and I can experience in this life. That's what it means to know Christ. Our relationship with Christ, both now and in the future, is better than any human relationship that we'll ever experience. But we already know that human relationships are more valuable than possessions. Right? Amen? You agree with that? I hope you do. How many of you would rather have a Ferrari or a best friend that would never, ever let you down no matter what the circumstances? We'd want that relationship. I mean, going zero to 60 in three seconds would be a lot of fun, but that doesn't last forever. Having those relationships are so much more important. And Paul learned more and more about Christ and Christ's plan for mankind. He valued that more than everything in his past. Another passage I want us to look at is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 6. And this is what people know right now, today in the world, and what God has revealed to us. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians 3 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, people who don't know Christ. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Do you see this in the world today? A lot of people who have veiled themselves, they do not know what the truth is. I mean, we see this every day. It's getting worse, I think. Verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This passage teaches us that God blesses us with knowing Jesus Christ. God reveals to us the truth of Jesus Christ. And because of that, you and I, we know God's plan. We know what the future holds. And it also means that we do not need to panic or fear the things in this life because they cannot change what God has planned for us. If there's ever a week that we need to remember that, it's this week that's coming up. Anyone curious about the election on Tuesday? I think most of us wish we can just kind of fast forward and just kind of find out the results. I don't know who's going to win the election, but you know what I do know? I know what Ephesians 1.11 says. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who, now listen to this, works all things according to the counsel of his will. What happens on Tuesday will be in accordance with the counsel of God's will. And I don't know who's going to win, okay? But I do know that I have an inheritance, and if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have an inheritance. And nothing is going to happen that is outside of God's will. And knowing that is better than knowing who's going to win the election on Tuesday. Do you believe that? I hope you do. Amen. And between these two things, I would rather take God's will any day. And this is the first thing that Paul says is better than his past accomplishments. Paul knows the truth. He knows the good shepherd. And Paul knows the plan that God has for him and all mankind. And the second thing that Paul tells us in this passage here in Philippians is that having the righteousness of Christ is better than having his own righteousness according to the law. 
Now, the thing about righteousness is the Bible tells us in order for you and I to live forever in God's presence, we have to be righteous. And to be righteous means having been viewed by God to having done what is right and good in his eyes. But the Bible has, it tells us there's a problem with that. None of us can do this. And the Jews had misunderstood the point of the law. They thought that they could earn this righteousness necessary to live with God. They thought they could earn that by following the law. But ultimately, that just became a burden that they could not carry. When you get into the New Testament, God and Jesus Christ and some of the authors, they're telling us clearly no one could live up to the law. In fact, they called the law a burden. In Luke eleven forty six, 46, Jesus says, And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with your own fingers. The law was a burden for them. They could not bear it up. And you get to Acts chapter 15, which is a very important passage in Scripture, This is where they are trying to figure out what place the law still has within God's program. Are we supposed to follow it and try to bring our own righteousness because of the law? And that's what the Judaizers were doing. Acts 15, 1 says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, it's great that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but you still need to earn your own righteousness. And the the disciples, they had some discussions about this, the apostles. And finally, Peter stood up in verse 10. And he says to them, Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? No one can become righteous by following the law. No one could ever do it. No one could ever live up to the law. And because of that, No one is righteous and worthy of God's favor. One of the best passages in the Bible that teaches us about the righteousness of Christ and how we get that is in Romans. So I want to read a portion of scripture from Romans chapter 3. And as we read this, what I want you to realize, Paul is writing Romans, but at one time, maybe 20 years before Paul wrote this verse, this chapter, Paul himself didn't know this or understand or agree with it. He thought that he could have earned God's righteousness through his own works. But now he knows Christ, and this is what he writes. Romans 3, beginning in verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Verse 20 is the most important in this passage. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And it's amazing that at one time, Paul thought just the opposite. He thought that he could be justified in God's sight through his own righteousness from the law. But then he met Jesus. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and now he knows. And now he knows Jesus. And now he knows what Jesus has to offer us. Jesus offers to exchange his righteousness for our sins. And it just takes our faith and Christ will give us his righteousness. It goes on in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus 
whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You know, you think of Paul, you know, on the road or shortly thereafter, the light bulb started to go off. And Paul started to make these connections, and he realized his righteousness in the law meant nothing. In fact, he calls them the pile of worthless, filthy rags. Now he knows, he knows the righteousness of Christ, and he knows that his righteousness was worthless. But Christ's righteousness is offered to all of us as a free gift. Who wouldn't gladly exchange their worthless righteousness for Christ's? That's the message that Paul is sharing. In fact, in fact, Paul was so passionate about this because his fellow Jews were misguided and they were still thinking they had to earn God's favor. He made it his mission to share not only with the Gentiles, but also with the Jews that this is the righteousness that can save you. Listen to Paul's heart for his fellow Jews that they know Jesus the way that he now knows Jesus. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They don't know Jesus Christ. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So when Paul came to know Christ on the road to Damascus, he started to know Christ, and he realized everything in his past is absolutely worthless. And next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the other things that Paul mentions in the future that are worth more value than anything that we'll have in this life. But until then, until then, until we're here next week and we're studying God's word, we have to make it through this week, right? We got to make it through this week. Uh, a lot of uncertainty this week. We don't know what's going to happen, but this is a reminder for us. As we get caught up in this life, remember, there is nothing in this life more valuable than knowing Jesus. And when we know Jesus, we know the truth. We know that we don't have to try to earn God's favor. And we also know that God's plan is right on schedule. Amen? Amen. Well, let's turn to the Lord in prayer and let's thank him for allowing us to know him this way. Dear Lord, thank you. It's, it's an honor for us to read of the past and what you did to this remarkable man, the Apostle Paul, how, how you changed him thoroughly on the road to Damascus and how you revealed yourself to him so that now he knew you. Lord, all of us have a moment in our lives where we come, come to grips with our own righteousness, that it's not worth anything, that we cannot live up to the standards you've called us to. Help us to share this good news of the gospel, that we don't have to do it, that Jesus Christ did this, and he's offering us his righteousness, the forgiveness of sins, for free, by your grace, so that none of us can boast. Lord, I pray this week that we will be the examples that the world needs, that we, no matter what happens in, in our country, no matter what happens with the election, that we will have a peace that passes understanding and that we will act with dignity and that we will act with grace and that we will show the world what is the most important thing there is, and that is knowing you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with us and we'll close and sing. So Stop.
Stone is rolled away. Behold. 